Hello, good evening. My name is Emily Underwood. Thank you so much for coming out to the Missouri History Museum tonight. I'm so glad you were able to join us for our Perspectives on Science and History uh, lecture series this evening. Before we begin, I just have a few comments to make. Uh, so first of all, I'd like to ask that you please turn off any cell phones or Blackberries, anything else that might make noise during the evening. Also, I want to tell you a little bit about the Academy of Science St. Louis, with whom we are very pleased to be partners on this lecture series. Many of you may be Academy members and friends, but for those of you who aren't familiar, I do want to give you a brief introduction. The Academy is an independent science organization supported entirely through community contributions. They've been connecting science in the community since 1856 and have a long-standing mission to advance the public understanding of science and inspire the next generation of scientists and science advocates. They continue to celebrate more than 150 years of community service by offering a broad range of free and low-cost public science programming, collaborative seminar series, and trips and tours highlighting science at venues throughout the region. You can get information about the Academy at their website, which is www.academyofsciencestl.org. There's also some literature on the table outside, so if you'd like to pick that up on your way out, um, please feel free to do so. And you'll also find out there a calendar of events for the Missouri History Museum. It covers all of our programs for December through January, including other programs related to George Washington. And uh, of course, it does also include the next Perspectives on Science and History talk, which is scheduled for Wednesday, February 20th, also at 7 p.m. right back here in the auditorium. The program that night will be presented by Dr. Stephen Bruce, who is Associate Professor in the Department of Psychology and Clinical Director of the Center for Trauma Recovery at the University of Missouri-St. Louis. And uh, Dr. Bruce is going to speak about interpersonal violence using neuroimaging and genotyping to understand PTSD risk, resilience, and recovery. And that talk is being presented in a conjunction with a traveling exhibit called The Doll Project, which is a photographic exhibit featuring images of makeshift monuments erected throughout the St. Louis area for those who have fallen victim to a crime or untimely and tragic circumstances. Um, that exhibit opens at the museum on January 19th, so mark your calendars for that and for the talk on February 20th. And if you'd like to receive e-notifications of Academy events, um, there is, should be an e-newsletter sign up going around. If you don't get it in the audience, then um, there will be also on the table outside uh, on your way out this evening. A couple other little things, if you didn't get one already on your way in, we're handing out free admission tickets for the Delta, I think Delta Dental Health Museum. So if you didn't get your ticket and you'd like to get one, it's good through the end of next year. And um, there are some handouts from Dr. Stutt also on the back uh, ledge there if you didn't get one and you'd like to take one. So with that said, I would like to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Kurt Stutt. Dr. Stutt is currently a clinical professor of applied dental medicine at Southern Illinois University Edwardsville and an adjunct faculty member at St. Louis Community College Forest Park in the, in the Department of Dental Hygiene. In addition to teaching, he also has a part-time private practice. Dr. Studd is here with us tonight to talk about the sometimes cringeworthy history of dentistry with a peek at today's kinder and gentler dental technology. His talk, Brushing Up on History, Dentistry Through the Ages, is being presented in conjunction with the exhibit Discover the Real George Washington, New Views from Mount Vernon, because of course he's potentially the most famous denture wearer in American history. And uh, that exhibit is currently on display here at the museum, and it's gonna stick around through January 21st, so I hope you make plans to see that if you haven't done so already. It is free to St. Louis city and county residents on Tuesdays. So um, if you like to mark your calendar for a Tuesday, that's always a good day to catch things around here. So um, with that, we're pleased to have Dr. Studd uh, join us tonight, and uh, please help me in giving him a nice warm welcome, Dr. Kurt Studd. Thank you, Emily. And I would like to thank the Academy of Science and the Missouri, Missouri History Museum for inviting me tonight. Um, I'm so anxious to spill all of this information out that I've gathered in the last few months. Uh, I just couldn't wait to get up here and start spewing it out to you. Uh, as you know, history is made by people, and dentistry is no different. The history of dentistry is made up of, made by thousands and thousands of people over centuries. Uh, dating back to 3000 BC. Now I'm supposed to cover the history of dentistry in one hour. I don't think I'm going to get to all of those years during uh, those, those last five, uh, 5,000 years. But um, we want to talk about George W. today. Um, and I don't mean Bush. 
George W., George Washington, the father of our country, was known to, I believe, have cut down a cherry tree his dad had planted. And when his dad asked him who cut the tree down, he said, Father, I cannot tell a lie. I cut the tree down. I think that's the story the way it goes. Unfortunately, um, when it came to his dental treatment and his dental problems, he was a little more evasive, a little more devious, and a little less than honest. Um, he is, of course, America's first and most well-known of dental patients. He suffered from many acute and chronic dental diseases throughout his 67 years of life. Um, and he wrote many long letters and diary entries about his dental uh, condition. Everything is preserved, oops, sorry, we're going the wrong way here, um, including six, cents, six sets of his dentures. He's had many dentures made throughout his lifetime, from partial dentures and kept adding teeth and adding teeth until he was wearing virtually full dentures at the time of his death. Um, he was very sensitive about his dental problems and didn't want anyone to know about his dentures. And I think a lot of people, even today, wearing dentures would rather not have other people know that they have false teeth. Well, he didn't want his dental bills lying around his, his home or his office as evidence of his expensive dental treatment. In November of 1755, in a ledger, he had owed Dr. William Baker 14 pounds, six shillings. Converted to America's money would be about seven to eight hundred dollars. And in Washington's day, you could buy five dozen eggs and four pounds of butter for 25 cents. So when he's spending 14 pounds, six shillings, over seven, eight hundred dollars, he's spending a lot of money for his teeth. Instead of paying his dental bill, he actually paid his, uh, his dentist's hat bill. And uh, in May of 1783, he asked his lieutenant colonel aide from Newburgh, New York, to seek out a new dentist that he'd heard about, and he sent a letter in with this uh, uh, military aide explaining that he had some teeth that gave him a great deal of pain. And then in that letter, he crossed the word pain out and said, quote, they're very troublesome to me at times, and I wish to be eased of them, provided I could substitute others, but no transplantation. So uh, after, as part of the letter, he said, I would not wish that this matter should be made parade of, unquote. So Lieutenant Colonel Smith made the connection with the new dentist in July the 1st, 1783, and the new dentist's name was Jean-Pierre Lemur, who came to America in 1781 from London. He's a French-trained uh, dentist. He made three false teeth for George, and he sent them to Virginia, coded in a letter as the leases. Several dentists were invited by George throughout his lifetime to his uh, home in Mount Vernon, and some actually stayed the weekend and rendered render dental treatment for him. Now, after John Greenwood uh, extracted George's last tooth, he asked if he could keep it and put it in a silver capsule attached to his watch chain. It was known that George Washington bought, bought his own dental instruments and actually adjusted his own dentures uh, himself. He frequently also told his dentist how he wanted his teeth made or how he wanted them positioned in his mouth to give him more lip support or they were too long or too short, so he sort of dictated how he wanted his teeth to look. Uh, Greenwood advised George not to soak his dentures in uh, port wine. Now in those days, port wine uh, was, given, was recommended by the physician to freshen his breath, to keep bad breath away, and it was also drunk uh, with meals and between meals because the water in the colonial times was pretty polluted. George was a big man. He was six feet, three inches tall, weighed 180 pounds, and wore size 13 shoes. But he suffered four very serious illnesses by the time he was 29 years old. And after that, throughout his lifetime, he suffered from dysentery, infections, chest colds, pains, and various dental problems with the extractions of his teeth beginning at about age of uh, 22. So he start, lost his first tooth at age 22. Later in life, he became deaf, uh, hard of hearing, and they feel that this might have been due to his bad teeth and infected teeth. The principal drugs, the principal drugs in his account book were mustard bark sulfur, camphor, 
Glauber, Glauber salts, rhubarb, calomel, which is a mercurous chloride solution used as a cathartic. And his drug of greatest faith was quinine. He um, loved uh, to use quinine for various ills that he had. The extreme mercury toxicity that he uh, uh, ingested with all of these various drugs uh, possibly resulted in some dental problems also because we know high mercury can cause gum problems. Uh, he always paid his dental bill on time and uh, never failed to write a thank you note to each dentist who treated him. Two of his physicians Two of his physicians who treated George during his last illness were later tried for murder because they dosed him with calomel, blistered his skin, and bled him when he was too weak to endure the treatment. However, these charges were sorely, uh, hardly fair because following uh, the normal procedures and normal treatment in those days, bleeding was a standard method of care. And in those days, people sold their, their anterior front upper teeth uh, so they could be used on other people's dentures, and they would usually sell them for about two guineas, which averages about 5 to $10 each. Some of these pictures uh, show George Washington. This is, this is the one of him uh, by Gilbert Stewart. Uh, it was told in the history that he, Gilbert Stewart did not like George Washington very well and painted the picture on the right showing George next to the bad end of a horse. This is a picture of his dental prosthesis, one of the last ones made for him by uh, Dr. Greenwood, swaged of gold. Um, so the roots of dentistry, where did dentistry start? How did we get the word dentistry? Well, in 3000 BC, um, papyrus and hieroglyphics, um, dental Treaters were called treaters or makers of teeth, toothers, tooth workers, toothists. So this is how the, the uh, 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 descriptions were, were written in the hieroglyphics. Hesse Ray, displayed here on one of the tomb walls, was called the first known dentist. He was the chief, great chief of the toothers and physicians. And by saying toothers and physicians, toothers came first. So the hierarchy of specialty training uh, led with a certain class pride and social order. The Egyptians uh, uh, had another tombstone that actually inscribed that translate directly into the modern word dentist. From, from the 14th to the 16th century, the dentist was called a barber, a surgeon barber, dentaris, or a dentista. In 1557, he was referred to as a tooth inspector. In the late, 18, late 16th to early 17th century, during the reign of Elizabeth, dentistry marked time and kind of slipped backward. The dentist was an itinerant and was called a kind heart. These tooth drawers went around from town to town and wore these outrageous costumes and had emblems or trade signs as well as uh, barber surgeon uh, emblems. And uh, they didn't have a very good reputation in those days. Uh, the French adage came up, uh, quote, to lie like a tooth puller, unquote. A new cycle of greater dignity was ushered in in the 1700s by Pierre Fouchard, who is considered the father of dentistry. He wrote a textbook in 1728 called Le Chirurgien Dentiste, The Surgeon Dentist. It's the earliest text known on dentistry uh, as a topic. The English resented this French title of dentista. In the Edinburgh Chronicle in 1759, a, a gentleman named Sam Rudder advertised himself in the Chronicle as a dentist, but mob action forced him to be called a tooth drawer instead. The French Revolution in 18. 1789, 1799, all surgical and medical qualifications sort of were abolished and went by the wayside. Any person was free to practice the healing arts in France in the late 1700s. Dentistry was in its infancy in the colonial America. It was sort of a do-it-yourself time, and most of the techniques were brought over from England and France. 
In 1764, um, in the London Chronicle, uh, it, professional titles were used to the extreme. One rustic barber surgeon joined some titles together to style himself on his shop board as an oculist for the teeth. Bailey's English Dictionary in 1770 des described an operator for the teeth as one skilled in cleaning, drawing teeth, and making artificial ones. And there was another French, French dictionary uh, uh, description called dentiste, and uh, they the first time to describe a denture as a set or gang of teeth. So dentist is of French origin. The change to dental surgeon came in 1820 when Anson B. Hayden used it in advertisement. In 1840, the American Society of Dental Surgeons be began to confer, uh, uh, was formed, and the Baltimore College of Dentistry, Baltimore College of Dental Surgery, began to confer the degree DDS, which has stuck to this day. DDS meaning Doctor of Dental Surgery. But the title doctor really didn't come into full use until, 19, until 1769. It was only referred to physicians, and the dentist was excluded. But now, of course, the word dentist designates the specialty of medicine uh, dealing with the oral cavity. America's first dentist, let me see if we're up on this. Okay, uh, let's go back here. America's first dentist was a gentleman named William Tinley. When the Mayflower came over in 1620, there were no, sur no dentists on board. There were some surgeons on board that had a case of very fearsome instruments, extracting uh, forceps and elevators. And about 10 years later in 1630, the Plymouth Company in Boston sent from London a company of physicians, an apothecary, and three barber surgeons. This was 1630. Two of the three names are lost to history, but the third one was William Dinley. He's the, he was a nonconformist, belonged to a fringe religious group, and uh, came over in an old record accusing him of, uh, of converting his patients or people that he had in his, his uh, dental chair he would also cut their hair and take out their teeth at the same time. Um, he was disenfranchised and denounced as a heretic, but the last chapter came in the winter of 1638, Roxbury, M Massachusetts. Um, there was a patient, a gentleman suffering from a severe toothache and was in agony. He sent his maid to Mr. Dinley's home to ask him to come and draw the offending tooth, in other words, extract the tooth. Um, he bundled himself up, ready to go out on this winter night, but his wife was expecting in a very short time uh, ahead and uh, asked him and begged him and prayed that he wouldn't go and wait till the morning. The, the wind was blowing and the snow was blowing, really blizzard conditions, but he, had, he was insistent on making this house call. So he uh, left with the maid and they went into the snowstorm and the, the whirling snow and the blizzard conditions, his weeping wife left at home with child um, and a very dark outside. Well, anyway, the maid won out and on their way they got lost in the snowstorm and were found a few days later frozen in the snow. Uh, he's the first dentist who died in the line of duty. Um, his wife shortly thereafter gave birth to a baby boy and in the church registry she named the baby boy Father Gone Dinley, father gone because he was a fatherless boy. Um, these are extraction keys. Um, we have a sample of one from the History Museum up here, and these were uh, one of the first types of instruments used for extracting teeth in, uh, in the mouth, uh, and usually without anesthetic. Um, they were f developed in 1753, I believe. And um, they had different uh, applications, different uh, keys or, or jaws that would fit in there depending on the size of the tooth. And with a uh, quick twist of the wrist, you might take one tooth or you might take more than one. And part of the jawbone also. So it wasn't unusual. Um, John Baker, let me see if we've got a picture of him. Okay, we're gonna, 
We're going to talk about the early giants of history. I think we're going to skip Mr. Baker. He was one of George Washington's dentists. Um, he advertised in the Maryland Gazette, promised to cure scurvy of the gums, prevent teeth from rotting, and make them, quote, white and beautiful. And if they're missing, he'll transplant some from another person. He also makes artificial teeth so the person can speak, sleep, and eat with them. His practice includes the nobility of many countries. Obviously, none of America's early dentists ever died of modesty. George Washington um, was seen by uh, uh, Mr. Baker, uh, among other uh, dentists, during his time. <clears throat> a Dr. Hamilton in the 18, 1760s described a tincture that he used in the mouth, declaring he can cure the most violent toothache in minutes without drawing the tooth. And his slogan states, quote, no cure, no pay, unquote. Well, his medicine, this tincture, also cured earaches, scurvy, swellings, and headaches. We don't know what the tincture was made of. But we're going to talk about American dentistry a little bit and some of the early giants of American history. One of the first ones is John, is Isaac Greenwood, the senior. He was the first native-born dentist in America. He began, began his practice in 1778. He was the first one to use a dental slogan and to use newspaper to educate the public. The teeth and general health uh, were described in, in a picture of the toothbrush to illustrate his ads. He was the first in a long line of Greenwood dentists. So these are, these are uh, uh, a dynasty of Greenwoods that started by uh, Isaac in the early uh, mid-1730s. John Greenwood, his uh, second son, is right here. Um, he uh, followed Isaac in dentistry, began his practice in 1785 at 25 years of age. And again, uh, kind of a do-it-yourself, learn as you go, pick up the techniques from uh, the, the books that were available in those, those years. He, he had a great carving skill as an apprentice cabinet maker. He made his own instrument cabinet and was the first, made the first foot engine from a spinning wheel. I think I've got that here. No, I, I, that's going to be later. Um, he, he disagreed with John Hunter, another famous dentist in those years, who... Uh, attributed tooth decay to tooth worms, and uh, John Greenwood said it was either acid formation or bacteria. So this is when one of the earliest uh, descriptions of the plaque came into the dental uh, literature or dental uh, discussions. He is called, John Greenwood's called the father of American dentistry. He was Washington's favorite dentist and made four sets of dentures for George. The next one is Isaac John Greenwood, and he is at the very far side over here. Isaac John Greenwood was the son of John Greenwood, the grandson of Isaac, John, of Isaac Greenwood. He practiced 24 years and retired at age 45 to devote his time to recording and publishing important cases. He translated into English a French text and wrote and illustrated his own book, The Treatise Upon Dentition. In 1841, he became a member of the American Society of Dental Surgeons and served the following year as collaborator for the American Journal of Dental Science, one of the earliest dental journals uh, in history. He earned a medical degree from Shurtev College in March of 1842. Jean-Pierre Lemur, which we, who we talked about earlier, is this pictured right here, one of Washington's dentists. He was French-born. He practiced surgery in London, came to America, and he was interested in transplanting or implanting teeth. He became a Virginia citizen, and George sought him out and was his dentist for several, several years. Washington wrote him 38 letters and dozens of diary entries, and he became very, they became very intimate friends. He died in 1806 at Mount Pleasant, Virginia. Paul Revere who is right next to this uh, Dr. Lemure. Oops, we're going to back up here and there's Paul. Was never really a dentist per se. He was a silversmith. He was engraver, a goldsmith, a bell caster, a copper worker, a politician. 
and they said the only dental delegate at the Boston Tea Party. But he never called himself a dentist. He never attempted to do operative dentistry, drilling and teeth and filling and so forth, extracting teeth. He mostly was more of a prosthodontist and made teeth for people, but never made a denture for George Washington. But he did inadvertently pioneer the field of forensic odontology, that is the, the uh, science of identifying human remains uh, by their dental records or their, by their teeth. He, uh, he was able to identify a Dr. Joseph Warren killed in the Battle of Bunker Hill by uh, identifying the hippopotamus teeth that were wired into uh, Mr. Warren, Dr. Warren's uh, jaw. So he identified him after his death. Josiah Flagg, uh, Boston uh, 1783 began his practice. He is... Uh, second gentleman here. Josiah Flagg was an early oral surgeon. He, uh, quote, sewed up hair lips, fixed palates, greatly assisting the pronunciation and swallowing, unquote, and, quote, regulated children's teeth, unquote. He created a very early dental chair and was first to practice pulp tapping. This is the early dental chair that uh, Josiah Flagg invented, uh, not really invented, just added a headrest to a regular armchair, um, but that was the first uh, dental chair. Um, this is one of his uh, uh, ads in one of the uh, uh, papers out on, in Boston in the late 1790s. They go into very large detail about their various uh, uh, subjects that they practice and how they practice and so forth. We won't go into that, but um, that was uh, Josiah Flagg, another big name in dentistry. Uh, Levi S. Parmley, um, who is a gentleman second from the right over here, lived in the late 1790s, died in 1889 at the age of 99. He was the first of four brothers in dentistry. He was a pioneer in dental hygiene. Um, there were 18 dentists in two generations named Parmley. He added to the sparse dental literature and was honored in both Europe and America. Chapin Harris was the first dean of the first U.S. dental school that was founded in Baltimore, Maryland. The Baltimore College of Dental Surgery was founded in 1840. He authored several pioneer dental textbooks, and uh, the college is shown here in its very first home, uh, and the, actually the very first official dental college in the United States. Another giant of American dentistry is Horace Wells. Horace Wells was 33 years old when he died, but he was the first dentist to use nitrous oxide, or laughing gas, as anesthesia for a tooth extraction. And he's considered the father of dental anesthesia. He was in Hartford, Connecticut, uh, where he practiced. William T.G. Morton, the gentleman to the right, um, is the member of the first graduating class of the Baltimore College of Dental Surgery. He is responsible for the use of ether as a general anesthetic and for the extraction of teeth. In those years, it was called Lethion, L-E-T-H-E-O-N, and he extracted a bicuspid on September 30th, 1846, using ether. This is the operating room where Dr. Wells did his surgery, and there's a dental chair um, to the right where the bicuspid was extracted. And this is another patient they're going to put under ether for an operation. Finally, well, almost finally, uh, Lucy Hobbs Taylor, the first woman dentist, lived from 1832 to 1910. She could not get admitted to any dental school because she was a female, so she found a preceptor, Dr. Samuel Wardle, and he accepted her as a student in his office on her 28th birthday. And in March of 14, 1861, she opened her own dental office, but a female dentist was a novelty in those years. And so few patients came to her office. She moved her office or moved her 
whole family to Iowa, became successful and was elected to the Iowa State Dental Association. Uh, she did not graduate from a dental school. She got all of her training on the job under Dr. Wardle. And let's see, we're going to be finally here. Yes, we're going to talk about green, Vardam, and black. Oops, this is, yeah. Dr. Black is the uh, third one from the right here. He is considered the father of modern dentistry. He uh, had very little formal education, believe it or not, but he won four honorary doctorate degrees. He was the one who standardized our operative procedures. He wrote the book on prepping uh, teeth for cavities for fillings, uh, a standardized step-by-step uh, -step procedure. He wrote uh, the uh, um, how the cavity was to be prepped in relation to the, how the enamel was formed and how the enamel structure uh, was seen under a microscope. He was a big uh, pioneer in the placement of amalgams and gold foils and a pioneer in prevention, dental hygiene and dental prevention. He opened a dental office in Jacksonville, Illinois during the Civil War and became dean of Northwestern University Dental School in 1891 until his death in 1915. So those are the, some of the giants of, of American dentistry and a lot of important names uh, that we relate to various uh, uh, decades during the uh, uh, early years of dentistry. We're going to talk a little bit about the history of dentistry through the ages, but as I say, we're looking at 5,000 years of dentistry, and I've just sort of picked and choose some of the highlights of some of the important civilizations that uh, had dentistry as, as some of the uh, important aspects in their uh, culture. Um, the first one was uh, the Old Kingdom from 3100 to 2181 BC in Egypt. These are the Egyptians. Uh, the pharaoh Zosier was the uh, reigning pharaoh. The earliest dentist was Hesi Ray, uh, previously discussed uh, earlier in the presentation, but in those years, in, in that time, uh, extraction was a treatment of choice, and how teeth were extracted remains to be seen. But um, one uh, finding was a uh, jawbone that was found at one of the sites showing uh, a couple of holes drilled in the jawbone to relieve the pressure from pus that was building up around this abscessed tooth. Uh, so this was about 1570 BC, they dis determined this. Um, and in those days, uh, this, this uh, was found at the Saqqara in the, during the New Kingdom. The Egyptians were mostly vegetarians. They ate very little meat, but they were growing their grains and their uh, various crops in very sandy, gritty soil. And uh, when they came to grind the wheat or the, the corn in their millstones, the, the roughness of the millstone actually uh, came off and some of the grit m mixed in with the, uh, with the uh, grain and the, the powdered uh, uh, wheat. And then, they, of course, they baked that and they ate it, so it was very, very coarse and very grainy, gritty. They ended up with severe uh, attrition or wearing down of the teeth, as we can see over uh, with this uh, skull here where the teeth have worn down. Sometimes they wore down to the point uh, of getting into the pulp of the tooth, into the nerve, resulting in abscesses and cyst formations. There's papyrus called the Ebers papyrus, or papyri, I think there's a lot of them. They refer to uh, terms of gingivitis, pulpitis, erosion, and toothaches. In the Egyptian times, the cure for gum swelling was to reduce to a paste one part of cumin, one part incense, and one part onion. Reduce it to a paste and apply it to the tooth or the gum that was giving you the pain. Um, the teeth in this next, let me just see here in the next one. Are we going to see the teeth? Nope, we're not going to see those. I thought I had those on there. Wired teeth. Nope. Okay. Uh, there are some gold wired teeth, which I failed to put in this uh, series here, that were found in 1952 near Cairo. In the old, near Cairo, they're from the Old Kingdom. Uh, some molars were also found that were wired together. So the the people in those times suffered from periodontal or gum disease, and the teeth started loosening up. So they would take this gold wire 
and wrap it around the teeth that were loose and anchor them to the teeth that were more stable. And this is how they solved the problem and prevented the loss of the teeth for a while. Okay, the um, uh, culture, the uh, time of Mesopotamia from 3500 to 3000 BC. Mesopotamia was uh, developed a uh, civilization in the Tigris Euphrates Valley, Valley, which is present day Iraq. And there were clay tablets with cuneiform writing that survived in the Royal Library. Uh, Babylonia in the uh, 1790s to 1750s BC uh, gave us uh, King Hammurabi. King Hammurabi wrote a co code of laws that had 282 paragraphs pertaining to the medical and medicine and dentistry and, and how it should be practiced. This is a picture of Hammurabi um, standing before the um, uh, sun god Shamash. This is Hammurabi here and this is Shamash. This is on a, on a diorite uh, stone slab. And uh, the, uh, some of the uh, laws in this, uh, in this Hammurabi's uh, uh, code said that um, the state of the teeth is determined by the state and course of the illness. So if you're ill, they look at your teeth and determine if you're grinding your teeth, the disease is going to last a long time. If you're grinding your teeth and your face feels cold, the disease is contracted through the hand of the goddess Ishtar. In those years, in those uh, BC years, the tooth worm they felt was the cause of uh, tooth decay. And in those days, they also took, to try to get rid of the tooth worms, they would uh, burn a, a plant called henbane and waft the fumes of that, the smoke, into the patient's mouth. And as henbane burned, it would create an ash that looked like little black worms. And as that fell out, on the ground, they would say, we're getting rid of the worms on, in your tooth. You see them falling here on the ground. Um, another thing that was documented, a ripe fig and an apricot were given to the tooth worm by the shamash. And the worm states, quote, this is just a portion of the statement, lift me up and among the teeth and gums cause me to dwell. The blood of the tooth I will suck and of the gum will I gnaw the roots, unquote. Okay, this is an ivory carving from 1780 of what they felt was inside the teeth that caused the cavities, the tooth worms eating from the inside of the tooth outward and uh, pretty intricate uh, carving that was done in the uh, late 1700s. The Phoenicians um, also, th these are the wired teeth that I wanted to show you a little early, but the Phoenicians uh, were contemporaries of the Egyptians and the Hebrews, and they grew up or, or had their civilization around in Lebanon and uh, their main city being Tyre. King Hiram of the Phoenicians sold cedars of Lebanon to King Solomon, who built his temple with them. And in 1901, a mandible was found at Sidon from about 500 BC, showing anterior teeth stuck on this now. Okay, this is from Sidon in Lebanon. This mandible was found in 1901 and it shows the results of periodontal disease in the lower front teeth here and those lower front teeth were then wired together uh, to the better teeth here to hold them in place for as long as they could. And this is done even today now. I mean, we have periodontists and gum specialists who will help uh, to maintain a periodontally involved teeth with splinting and, and stabilization to more uh, uh, solid, solidly anchored teeth. <clears throat> and this is some more, uh, some other examples of teeth wired from Sidon and um, uh, 
how they're held together. And actually, I believe they were actually drilled some holes in these teeth and wired them uh, to the others. And finally, the, uh, the ancient Hebrews also had their own uh, ideas of dentistry. They felt that the sound, healthy teeth were highly valued and that people that had uh, loose loss of teeth were weak and, and infirmed. Uh, before 1000 BC in the Bible, the Song of Solomon, a lover states, quote, your teeth are like a flock of sheep that are even shorn, which came up from the washing, unquote. The Hebrews themselves did not practice surgical or restorative dentistry. The Talmud states that the Phoenicians and Greek practitioners were used to take care of the Hebrews' teeth. And the Talmud is a collection of Jewish religious and civil laws. Um, the Hebrews looked at, looked at the human body sort of like a house with the, the head up here, the mouth, and the rest of the body as the rest of the house. And they, they felt that the mouth was um, the entrance to uh, the body so that it should be kept clean and, and meticulously uh, cared for. Um, Remedy for a toothache in those years, garlic, clove, ground with oil and salt, placed on the left or right thumbnail, depending on the source of the toothache. And you would put this mixture on your thumbnail and rim it with a ring of dough around it so that this material should not touch the flesh or it could cause leprosy. And there were many, many other remedies for toothaches in the Talmud. When we come to America, pre-Columbian America, before Columbus discovered America, the written records of the Mayas were destroyed by the Spanish conquistadors, and the conquerors, um, the conquerors from 300 to 900 AD, they uh, found that the Mayans decorated their teeth with uh, various types of stones, jade, hematite, gold, silver, and for cavities and um, they, they drilled the stone uh, cavities for these uh, implants with this uh, bow type of drill and a very uh, hard uh, stone type of straw-shaped uh, drill that would actually back and forth uh, with this bow would drill a hole in the enamel and then they would set these stones. They were also uh, known uh, for their tooth filing and uh, each tribe and each uh, area of, 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 let's go here. You can see how the teeth are filed depending on what tribe they belong to. The uh, stones were cemented with calcium phosphate and silica. In 1931, a mandible was found in Honduras dating to 600 AD. In that mandible, there were found three tooth-shaped tooth shells uh, that were placed in the bone after the teeth were extracted. They were to replace the missing incisors. These are considered the earliest endosseous alloplastic implants. In other words, these are implants of a non-human origin, alloplastic, and endosseous being inside the bone. And actually, they found out the two of them, compact bone was actually growing around these two uh, shell implants. In the Yucatan or Mexico, a Spanish bishop, Diego de Luda, described the excision of tooth decay with a burning stick. They used balsam of Peru, which is a tree resin, heated it until it glowed, and then split and put it on the gums inside and out. Now, this is without anesthesia, although I think it said the patient would chew coca leaves, which sort of gave a numbing uh, effect to the, to the oral tissues. But this heated uh, balsam of Peru was placed on the tissue. It burned away disease gum tissue, and uh, especially if you had periodontal disease, eliminated the periodontal pockets around the teeth and allowed new tissue to grow. OK, our patron saint. Uh, back in the 200 AD, uh, a young girl born in Alexandria, Virginia, Alexandria Egypt, was the daughter of a heathen magistrate. B. 
Before her birth, her mother was sympathetic with the Christians, although she wasn't a Christian herself. She, um, Christianity was growing in those, in those centuries. And uh, in 225 AD, uh, she prayed to the Virgin Mary for a baby and uh, Apollonia was born. Her, she instilled in Apollonia, her daughter, the wondrous power of prayer. Apollonia grew up, became a disciple of St. Anthony of Egypt and was baptized by St. Leonine. She preached the word of God in the streets in, of Alexandria and claimed many converts. But because the Romans were in power at that time, the uh, Christians were persecuted in Alexandria. Her father, a heathen magistrate, actually handed her over to the governor for judgment. He thought she was going against the beliefs of the Roman Empire. The uh, Roman soldiers tied her down and began to break out her teeth one by one. Um, this is one drawing of how it looked. This was common torture in the Roman Empire and also was the uh, torture of crucifixion. So this is a terrible way to die, or at least to uh, suffer un undue pain. Um, they, another picture shows her being tied down here and her teeth being removed or, or knocked out. She was beat and clubbed about the head and the face, but she refused to recant and refused to uh, worship the uh, pagan idols that the Romans did. And she asked if she could be released so she could say a prayer. And when they released her, she jumped and ran over into a burning fire and was emulated and died, crying out that those who pray to her will never suffer a toothache. So she is considered the pa patron saint of dentists, uh, as well as patron saint of those suffering from toothaches. Um, her saint, her uh, feast day is February the 9th. And one other thing I met, found that I thought was kind of interesting was this uh, set of teeth. Uh, these are from the Etruscans in Etruria, which is in, in, on the Italian peninsula. This is from 600 BC, and it shows a gold strap holding together uh, the natural teeth in the jaw with an ox tooth used as a false tooth or pontic right here. So this was a tooth from an ox that they riveted into this gold band and put it in to replace a missing tooth. There probably was another tooth, another band, uh, ox tooth here that was missing, and there's the rivet for it. It's kind of interesting. I'd like to talk a little bit uh, about a fellow named Painless Parker. I don't know if any of you have heard of Painless Parker, but he was a real piece of work, as they say. He was a flamboyant, eccentric figure who lived from 1872 to 1952. His name was actual real name, given birth name was Edgar Randolph Parker. He was a showman. He was born in New Brunswick, Canada. And uh, he was an innovator, a public health promoter, an industry gadfly, and mogul of the mouth. At age 17, um, at age 17, he was a peddler and a, and a seaman. And uh, he was considered, he had considered becoming a physician, but his mother was a devout Christian scientist and was aghast that he would consider f a medical practice when they were Christian scientists. So he uh, dutifully reconsidered. He sought out career guidance from a, from a phrenologist Phrenologists are those people that feel the bumps on your head and determine what your um, psychological makeup is. And it's a pseudoscience. And they discerned that um, his temperament and his character uh, showed that he had outstanding mechanical lines and he cared about people's health and rated high in the scientific and commercial and professional lines. So the final analysis, he'd make a good dentist. So in 1889, at 27 years old, he enrolled in New York College of Dentistry. And while he was a student, he peddled his dental skills and his dental knowledge from door to door. When he got to a door that uh, required some dental care, he would go with the, uh, he would start with the cook in the, in the household and take care of his teeth or her teeth first, his teeth first probably. And then if the, the cook liked the results, he would then get the lady of the house and the other members of the family. And uh, if it didn't kill the cook, he would end up getting other uh, people in the household. 
But if he encountered a problem with the, the tooth or teeth that were in question, he possibly hadn't learned that yet in school, he would excuse himself and leave and continue his studies until he learned about that particular problem and then would come back to the household and take care of the problem. Um, but because of his uh, uh, side dealings, he was uh, uh, left out of school and uh, could not uh, uh, practice dentistry. So uh, his moonlighting got him uh, expelled from school, and he returned to Canada as an itinerant dentist up in Canada. And he earned enough money then to enroll again in the Philadelphia Dental College, which is now Temple University. He got his degree, and he opened an office in New Brunswick, Canada. In three months, he earned 75 cents. So he was at a crossroads. Should he remain ethical and not advertise and starve, or should he use his skills that he learned as a peddler and his natural flair as a showman and a huckster to become successful? So he wrote a sermon on the evils of oral care and neglect and patterned uh, after his preachings, his preacher's hellstone and brimstone. He had diatribes and traveled around with medicine shows and gave, gave, uh, gave this talk to people in various towns. He offered extractions at 50 cents each and promised $5 to any patient who felt any pain. Um, he, he, uh, he used this new pain-killing discovery of his called hydrocaine. Well, they needed dentistry, he said, worse than I needed money, if that's possible. He said, I took 33 teeth out on 12 patients, and nobody screamed. And he said, why? I'll never know, because I ran out of hydrocaine on the seventh patient. <laughs> In two weeks, he was taking in $50 a day. He traveled throughout the U.S. and Canada, and at 21 years of age, he was, he was busted in Victoria, Canada for practicing without a license. Um, he then turned his career over. He turned his career over to P.T. Barnum's former publicity agent, William Beebe. He designed a saturation advertising campaigns and publicity stunts to make Painless Parker a household name. His Brooklyn Flatbush Avenue building from the 20s and 30s and, uh, is pictured here, and he opened a chain of flamboyant offices. This building was particularly un unique because it was a block long. The word it, which says I am positively it in painless dentistry, stood about four stories, uh, two stories high. I am positively it in painless dentistry. Yes, me, painless Parker. Sign in front of the building, a little lower down, says, Painless Parker, preeminent, par excellent, positively painless, perfection of practice, and philanthropically predisposed to popular prices. He opened more clinics, hired more dentists, and crowds were flocking to his clinics. Regarding complaints about the quality of his dental care, he offered a, letter, a later rebuttal saying, regardless of what the ethicals used to say about us, the materials and workmanship of what we produced was okay. He had parades going into towns. He was sitting on a large uh, float. They had uh, acrobats and performers, and had an, he was in an open carriage. He threw out five and 10 cent pieces into the crowd. He uh, exhibited painless tooth extractions, where actually the noise of the crowd was so loud you couldn't hear the patient screaming. Um, and he was his, he, he, that was the main anesthetic, was just the crowd noise. He became the butt of vaudeville jokes and was labeled as a, quote, dentist gone bad, unquote. New York's King County Dental Society, uh, you know, really didn't like him and take him very well, but he reveled in the notoriety. He uh, wore a seven and a half carat diamond ring and a four and a half carat diamond tie stud. He wore 357 teeth on his neck, on a necklace which he extracted in one day. In 1706, he left New York to go to California and retire at 34 years of age. He took a half to several million dollars with him. Six railroad cars, box cars of his furniture, took seven racehorses, a new Model 15 peerless, peerless motor car, which was the world's finest at that time, 
But he didn't like retirement out in California, and he bought a practice in a bad part of L.A. and used blimps and banner-towing airplanes to advertise his presence there. Lawsuits were abounding for his fraud and malpractice, but he aggressively claimed he never paid out a penny in damages. In 1913, he bought a circus. He used animals and acrobats to ballyhoo his grand openings of his offices. However, in 1915, California passed a law that any dentist must practice under their legal name. So four months after that law came out, uh, Edgar Randolph Parker changed his first name legally to Painless so he could keep his clinics open. He tirelessly, tirelessly advocated for oral health for the masses, which brought him a degree of, of acceptance, if not respect. Six weeks after his death in 1952, the California State Dental Board ordered removal of all advertising signs from his offices, and the chains were sold to individual operators. So I thought that was kind of an interesting uh, uh, take on it. These are some of the types of dental chairs and dental operatories that were used in the 1900s, early 1900s. I believe this was Dr. Green Vardaman Black's uh, dental office in Jacksonville, Illinois. Tooth is stranger than fiction. Uh, your handout shows a bunch of words that uh, pertain to toothaches. And uh, these toothache remedies are actually have been and, and perhaps are still used now. The first one is to gargle with your early morning urine. Not gargle, just rinse your mouth, rinse your mouth. Um, I understand, I had watched Dr. Uh, uh, Oz a few months ago, and he was talking about bodily functions and excretions and secretions and so forth. And he said that urine actually has a slight salty taste to it. It's kind of like your perspiration. And I suppose he's tasted it, but um, <laughs> the, old, the old adage that we tell patients who have had uh, oral wounds and, and uh, surgery, rinse with warm salt water every day, uh, rinsing with your own urine is kind of a way of using a warm, salty solution. Pierre Fouchard, the father of dentistry, actually said uh, in the 1720s that you rinse with urine and hold it in your mouth for some time. I guess you don't swallow it, but uh, the use of a, a warm onion held against the ear on the same side as a toothache is supposed to solve or cure your toothache, a warm onion. Uh, one one uh, civilization or one group of people uh, believed that eating grasshopper eggs would help cure a toothache. Chewing tobacco, so perhaps tobacco chewers have something we don't know about, it takes care of a toothache. Eating wax from an altar candle, another cure for the toothache. Plugging your cavity of your tooth with your own earwax. Filling your cavity with cow, cow dung. Applying a crushed ladybug to an aching tooth. Pricking the aching tooth, I guess, or really the gum, with a sliver of a pine tree that was stuck, struck by lightning. Pliny, uh, an ancient Greek philosopher, uh, recommended eating a mouse twice a month. New Zealanders even today eat the head off, off of an eel. And Roman ladies had a unique mouth rinse uh, they combined lizard livers, earthworms, steeped in vinegar, and the urine of an innocent boy, quote, unquote. Another, another cure would be eating the eyes of a vulture. An ancient Chinese, this is interesting, an ancient Chinese physician would recommend taking an arsenic pill on the gum close to the aching tooth and then going to sleep. Well, it would certainly cure the toothache, and you'd probably never wake up. Um, and believe it or not, um, the American Dental Association newspaper that just came out in November, earlier November, gave uh, information regarding remedies for toothaches today from the U.S. and Canada. This is what people today are using to cure toothaches in and around the United States. Remedies would be... Uh, use of ginger root, ginger root applied to the tooth, acupressure. In Ireland, they use vinegar. In Canada, they use a cutting from a cucumber. 
um, dried peppermint, well, actually dried peppermint, salt, water, and oats mixed together for a toothache. And in the U.S., um, they um, um, chew bologna, 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 chew it for 30 seconds, then swallow or spit it out. Um, and I guess it might work if it's Oscar Mayer, it's probably kosher. Um, that brings us to the end of this, and I do want to show you some of the uh, sources of my information. My son gave me this on my 60th birthday, uh, an excellent uh, volume written by a non-dentist, uh, The Excruciating History of Dentistry. When I was a freshman in dental school 50-odd years ago, we had a course in dental history, and I saved all of my class notes, and this was my class uh, notes from that course taught by Dr. Khalifa. And another uh, source was, uh, this is actually a children's book, but it's got some very interesting information in the back of it called George Washington's Teeth. It's written in poetry form, um, but uh, talks about how George Washington lost his teeth one by one throughout his lifetime. And uh, I got some information out of this book. The other one I got excellent information was written by Dr. Malvin Ring who graduated from St. Louis University Dental School. I looked him up on the internet and it appears that he's still alive. He's 93 years old, wrote this book in the 1980s. And it is an illustrated history of dentistry. It's a, it's a coffee table book, I have it up here. It has all of the photographs I used in the, uh, in the presentation in there. And um, 